Tonight on Cross Currents, Japan behind the mask. A disturbing look at the realities of modern Japan. Behind the popular image of happy workers and benevolent employers lie terrible social stresses and a poisoned environment. Has the price of this post-war miracle been too high? Cross Currents with Jim Carney. Japan, the economic miracle. Surely it's anything but a miracle, much more the result of circumstance, planning, and hard work. Let's put it in perspective. By the year 2000, Japan's gross national product per capita is expected to exceed that of the United States. Japan will become the wealthiest country in the world on a per capita basis. Another perspective. World trade is now driven by three major trading blocks, Europe, North America, and the Far East. They account for virtually all world GNP based on hard currency. Within this group, Japan will become the second biggest player, with one huge advantage over her first place rival, the United States. The US now owes more money than any other country in the world, while Japan is the world's greatest creditor nation. We're fascinated by this. It's difficult to avoid the temptation to, well, envy Japan, to wonder how she did it, and how we can hitch our wagon to her star. We see Japan as enormous corporations, a thriving, expanding economy, a high standard of living, job security, wonderful labor management relations, state-of-the-art technology, a nation totally engineered for economic and social well-being. In tonight's film, we learn about a darker side, a cost in human and social terms which is beginning to take its toll. It may come as a surprise to learn that relatively few Japanese have secured jobs with large corporations. The great majority of the labor force works for small business enterprises with lower wages, fewer fringe benefits, and far less security than the 15 to 20 percent who work for big corporations. One 1985 report describes Japan as a nation of small shopkeepers, family businesses, and minuscule subcontractors, and states that only 13% of Japanese workers are employed by corporations with 1,000 or more employees, compared to about 25% in the U.S. and nearly 40% in West Germany. Why should we care about Japan? Because with the exception of the United States, there is no country in the world more important to Canada's economic well-being. Forty years ago, Canada's biggest trading partner next to the U.S. was Britain, and of course Europe as a whole. Since then, our trade with the U.S. has dramatically increased, while our trade with Europe has declined in relative terms. But trans-Pacific trade is increasing. In 1982, our trade across the Pacific, for the first time, exceeded transatlantic trade. And Japan is by far Canada's biggest customer in the Pacific region. We're one of the very few countries with a trade surplus with Japan. We sell them more than they sell us. And by the end of next year, it's expected that Canada's trade with Japan alone will be substantially more than all of our trade with the European economic community. And British Columbians especially should be aware that very soon, 50% of the world's population will live in the Asia-Pacific region, and that region will be producing 50% of the world's gross national product. If Canada is to have a counterbalance to our trade dependency on the United States, it must be Japan. Canada's ambassador to Japan, Barry Connell Steers, was in Vancouver a few weeks ago. I asked him what were the two most important things he would want to say to Canadians about Japan. He said, first, realize it's important. Second, learn all you can about Japan. The ignorance in Canada about Japan is appalling. I hope for some of you, tonight is the beginning. Now, Japan behind the mask. In the first half of the 20th century, 
Japan changed from a feudal society to one of the world's leading industrial nations, a feat unparalleled in human history. In the second half of the 20th century, Japan's steel, ships, cars, computers and electronics dominate the world market. Japan has the highest literacy rate and the longest life expectancy of any nation ever. By the year 2000, Japan will almost certainly pass the United States in gross national product, making it the richest country in the world. You are more than likely to be watching this on a Japanese television set. If you're out, you may have recorded it on a video, Japanese, of course. And you may have checked the programs by your Japanese watch. Perhaps at the weekend, you drove to the park in your Japanese car and took snaps with your Japanese camera. And yet most of us know very little about the people who make these things. Few of us have been to Japan, and even fewer speak Japanese, leaving only stark images and often patronizing racist views. In the space of one lifetime, these images have changed from Madame Butterfly to a bloodthirsty yellow peril to cheap imitators to a nation now considered by some to be almost invincible, even a model for us all. Japan is a nation of masks. Learning to live behind a mask is a prerequisite of much of Japanese civilization. This documentary will look behind the mask of four important areas of Japanese life. The way ordinary Japanese work, the conditions under which they live, the way children are educated, the extraordinary part played by women, and behind perhaps the most impenetrable mask of all, the subtle yet forceful way the Japanese establishment is today reclaiming a nationalism denied them since the Second World War. There are said to be two ways of looking at the truth in Japan. Tatamai, which means truth publicly displayed, and Hone, which means private truth. It is these two truths that have fascinated me since my first visit to Japan almost 20 years ago, but which have always left a certain sense of frustration. It's as if what you see and hear is not all seal truths. It's often difficult for Westerners to understand the scale of Japan's recovery following the war, for no nation, apart from the Russians, suffered such total devastation. One in four of all houses was destroyed. More than 60 square miles in the five major cities were reduced to ash and twisted metal. The atomic bombs leveled Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it's not often realized that the firebombing of Tokyo caused much greater devastation. Under the American occupation of General Douglas MacArthur, a new constitution was formulated, which gave the defeated Japanese new freedoms. But who today are the beneficiaries of these new freedoms? The ordinary people of Japan who had suffered so terribly, or the great reborn companies like Mitsubishi, which had formed the industrial and financial base of the war? This is the public relations image of today's Japan, a place of high-tech perfection, where even the robots have a soft touch. Where happy, obedient workers are employed for life, with exercises every morning and with company unions and company songs and company weddings, and when it's all over, an engraved company helmet, gold for some, silver for others, and for those whose loyalty has meant higher and higher productivity, a company funeral and a company grave, right next to the boss. Well, that's the company image and our image of them. But there's another story, and one which affects the majority of ordinary people in Japan who are not robots. 
the Ministry of Labor uh, issues a lot of statistics about uh, working conditions, but uh, most of the statistics, for example, uh, statistics uh, on working hours and the, the length of the uh, holidays or, and so on, exclude the workers who work for the companies which uh, employ less than 30 people. And uh, that means that about 42% of the workers are excluded from the statistics. But uh, those are most unprotected, and uh, those are receiving the um, uh, worst working conditions in Japan. This man, Imbui Tai, runs a small factory near Tokyo. He's a subcontractor for Sony, Seiko, and National. His female workers will not be found in any statistics. They're known as part-timers, a euphemism for women who work for less than two pounds an hour, six days a week, and with no sick pay, no pension, and three days holiday a year if they're lucky. 40% of Japan's labor force are women who receive less than half the pay and none of the fringe benefits of many men. And most Japanese businesses are like this, and not like Nissan, Toyota, and other giants which are often little more than glorified assembly lines, subcontracting most of their work to backstreet factories. And this man is about to go bust. Today in Japan, bankruptcies are increasing as never before. The Minister of Labor's law says that uh, one week working hours should be less than 48 hours. But uh, most of the, those workers are working exactly the 48 hours per week and uh, receiving uh, just a six days annual leave, which is a minimum according to the labor standards law. Your annual in wage increase depends on the assessment of the management so that the, uh, you can't take the holiday as you like because the management regard uh, those workers are disloyal to the company. So all the time you have to prove you are loyal to the company. I know many workers uh, who have never taken any annual leave at all for more than 10 years and um, probably he has very bad cold, but uh, he goes to the office wearing uh, white masks. As the yen gains in value, Japanese exports are becoming dearer and dearer. This means that in an economy geared to exports and to high returns from high profits, the domestic market is being cut back. For the first time since the war, unemployment is a spectre. And like workers in Britain, the Japanese are finding that their trade unions are unable to protect them. The journalist and author Kamata Satoshi has many times probed behind the Japanese mask. His first book exposed conditions in the car industry after he'd gone undercover to work on an assembly line called Japan in the Passing Lane. It was a national sensation. あの、外国から見て一番わからないところっていうのは日本の工場の中でどうでしょうがあのあの怒られるし、労働組合の批判をすると会社の職生から怒られるということをあの言いますけど、そういう形であのどこに向かってもですね、労働者が自分のあの本音をあの言うとか、あるいはあの意味申し立てをですね、するとか。Well hidden behind the mask is this place, Sanya. Sanya is a district of Tokyo that has not appeared on maps of the city since 1966. It's an embarrassment. Sanya is a place of flop houses, controlled by the Yakuza, Japan's mafia, and inhabited by unemployed and destitute men who crowd onto the streets in the early morning to fight for a day's work. These desperate men are rushing the office of a subcontractor, hoping to get a day's wage from which gangsters take their cut. Several attempts to organize unions have ended in bloodshed. In 1985, more than 200 people died on Sanya's streets. That such a desperate jobs market should exist at all in Japan 
raises far-reaching questions about the Japanese economy. The post-war labor laws giving workers the right to organize and negotiate were perhaps the most important in bringing democracy to Japan because they meant that ordinary people could at last challenge the power of the huge companies that had controlled the economy and fueled the war. But in 1946, General MacArthur cancelled the right of public workers to strike, even to be elected to local government. He said Japan's stability was at stake. But what was really at stake was Japan's compliant role in American economic and Cold War strategy. Instead, company unions were formed and achieved high wages for elite workers, while the majority remained low paid. The legacy of MacArthur's ban was the weakening of real trade union opposition in Japan. Thus, today, the outside world sees only the mask of a docile workforce and a consensus society. You know, many of the, of the myths the Japanese have about themselves are myths that they borrowed from us. The myth of Japan as a consensus society, well, that's an American invention. The Japanese have taken it over very, very joyfully because it fits in with some of the things they like the world to think about them, but it's an American invention. And it's another myth. This isn't a consensus society. Somebody, some boss tells them what to do, but before he tells them what to do, there's a certain amount of happy talking so that everybody feels that he's had his say. But it's not a consensus. By privatizing Japan's national railways, in effect, asset stripping them, the government of Prime Minister Nakasone is determined to break one of the last unions to maintain its independence since 1945. Enforcing the old disciplines has become a crusade for Nakasone and no detail is overlooked. For instance, these railway guards must now salute their superiors or face the sack. <laughs> More than 70,000 workers have already been made redundant from the railways and another 100,000 jobs are threatened. That's the equivalent of wiping out British Rail altogether. The railway is at the heart of life in Japan because most Japanese are commuters, traveling up to four hours a day to and from work. They have no choice. Years of property speculation by the large companies have left no space in the cities for decent housing. Compared with its industrial development, housing in Japan is primitive. Almost half the homes still don't have flush lavatories, and some still don't have running water, and most don't have central heating. Parks, playing fields, trees, even the barest touch of green are rare. At the end of a train journey is this housing estate of almost identical ugliness to one in Britain. A dustman, Mr. Mazura Noda, his wife Katsuka and their four children live in what they call four rooms. The total space is 30 feet by 18 feet. As services are cut back, Mr. Noda is facing redundancy and what will keep his family going is this piecework which he and his wife do at night for a multinational company. It's a form of cheap labor familiar the world over. The noders are lucky if they can make seven pounds a day. This TV commercial for a Mitsubishi house expresses the Japanese dream to own a real home. 
三菱辞書です。For most Japanese, the reality, of course, is very different. This is an estate of company flats, provided at a price, for the elite workers and their families who make cars for the Nissan Motor Company. ミルクなんですねところが最近はその大企業の中の,この社宅もですねあのかなりこの管理が厳しくなってきてあの、まあ、主婦が12週間開いたりなんかそういうともまあ、まあまあ、できないとかですねつまり幼稚園の託児所を作るのもですね会社の規制があるそういうふうなあの会社の総務課があの、まあ、社宅を管理してるってことがあるんですね。もう一つで言いますとあの、うん、と最近はその社宅政策から持ち家政策にこの変わってきましてあの前だったらこの社宅に入るのがすごく希望だったんだけど今はあの、まあ、10年とかで期限を切ってですねその社宅からこの,この持ち家の方にですね誘導していってそのローンを会社が貸すという形に、まあ、なってるわけですねだから余計その,あのその会社であの縛り付けられてあの一生この、うん、働かないとその住宅ローンも返せない。This is Kawasaki, the world's biggest industrial city. Part of an industrial belt almost a hundred miles long, it lies between Tokyo and Yokohama, much of it on land reclaimed from the sea. One million people live here in flimsy wood and cement houses, side by side with petrochemicals, liquefied gas, power stations, and thousands of small factories. In many ways, Kawasaki is Japan's invisible city. The tourists don't see it, of course, and neither do many of those foreign businessmen, awed by the wonders of Japanese productivity and management, not to mention a workforce that is said to leap for joy every morning. There's not much leaping for joy here. Kawasaki is pollution-ridden, desperately overcrowded, and much of the equipment of the 3,000 subcontracting firms here is outdated. Just as the conditions of many of the underpaid and unprotected workers are far removed from those extolled in the glossy brochures of the famous names that depend on them. And yet it is here that two thirds of all of Japan's goods are produced. Mr. Amura Morisako is president of the Kawasaki Sufferers Association. Mr. Amura needs two intravenous injections a day just to breathe. He is one of 400 officially recognized pollution victims being treated in this one hospital. In the last few years, there has been strict control of the emission of sulfur dioxide, which shows itself as soot and dust, but little has been done about nitric oxide, which is everywhere and invisible. Spend a few days here and your throat is permanently dry and your eyes sting. It's to Japan's credit that unlike most other developed countries, it at least recognizes pollution victims. But the unofficial number of sufferers is said to be 10 times higher than the government figure. Kawasaki alone may well have up to 50,000 victims of the economic miracle. <laughs> These are old people playing croquet in what passes for a park in Kawasaki. Because Japan's rapid development has also led to a dramatic rise in life expectancy, the system is unprepared. There are pensions, but no free medical care and no supplementary housing or heating benefits. People must rely on their savings more than in any other developed nation. The majority of the Japanese people work very hard out of economic necessity. In order to buy a tiny little apartment house, in order to send their kids to a better school, and in order to keep up with other people in terms of clothing and other things. And when you look at each Japanese man, I do not think they are doing any extravagant things at all. They are very modest, you know. It's not because they want to work like a mad dog, possibly they have to. And the responsibility is on the whole of society. For example, 
we have much longer lifespan now, but our pension starts at the from the age of 65, or in some cases from 60. And yet, the amount of pension paid by the government is so small that each person has to have substantial saving in order to have a very comfortable old age life. This couple are being married in what is known in Japan as a Western ceremony. But as they weave their way through the guests, serenaded by Joe Cocker, they're performing a very Japanese ritual. They're giving thanks to the go-betweens who arranged their marriage. For a Western wedding is a mask. Of all the countries that have been bombarded by the Coca-Cola and Dallas culture, Japan has absorbed Western ways without being overwhelmed and undermined by them. But this poses extraordinary dilemmas. The battleship Missouri becomes the scene of an unforgettable ceremony, marking the complete and formal surrender of Japan. Admiral Nimitz escorts General MacArthur to the Missouri's veranda deck, where the 20-minute ceremony is to take place. It is Sunday, September 2nd, 1945. The Japanese surrender party arrives. They are headed by agent Mamoru Shigemitsu, foreign minister of the Japanese surrender cabinet, who was wounded by a Korean patriot in Shanghai years ago and walks on an artificial lake. The terms and conditions upon which surrender of the Japanese imperial forces is here to be given and accepted are contained in the instrument of surrender now before you. I now invite the representative... Since these scenes of capitulation more than 40 years ago, the Japanese have been subjected to an American constitution with a British-style cabinet and a constitutional monarchy operated by American-style political parties. They have accepted Washington-imposed restrictions on their military and have geared their trade towards the West. Today, this enforced marriage is threatened. In 1983, a four and a half hour Japanese documentary called Tokyo Trial was shown to public cinema audiences in Japan. The film showed the Allies' trial of Japan's wartime leaders, including the highly dubious selection of those brought to trial. It set Japanese war crimes against the morality of dropping the atomic bomb and compared the aims and actions of Japanese imperialism with those of Western imperialism. Above all, it dared to ask, was Japan really as guilty as the West claimed? It was a revelation to many Japanese. At last, wrote one observer, Japan is coming out. Accused Tojo Hideki on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East sentences you to death by hanging. A lot of people now say that our war contributed to the liberation of Asian people from the yoke of the rule by British, Dutch, etc. And, uh, but of course, it is not for the purpose of liberation of these people but it was just to replace one empire with another. But, you know, the, the, that's, a, that's a tricky point. And, and a lot of people think that maybe we did something good in, in this respect, which I think is totally wrong. And now, even, even today, I think the, many of people would accept if the voice is, is raised by the other Asian people, that what you did to us was war, war of aggression. Then a lot of people would agree, accept this. Look carefully at this man. He's the emperor of Japan, whose forces have committed the appalling atrocities against British Empire and Chinese troops and civilians, men and women in Hong Kong. These are the swine who bound and bandited our helpless soldiers in their hands. If these pictures serve to kindle a flame of vengeance throughout the civilized world, 
they will have served their purpose. Let the cry be vengeance, bloody vengeance. Regardless of that kind of hysterical propaganda, Emperor Hirohito has few equals in modern history as a quick change artist. From warlord in the 1920s to friend of the British royal family in the 1930s. According to General Tojo, the wartime leader, no decisions were made without the emperor's approval. And the Australian judge presiding at the Tokyo trial wanted him charged for war crimes and if found guilty, hanged. But MacArthur intervened and absolved him of any direct responsibility for the war. Thus cleansed, he could be welcomed to Buckingham Palace by the Queen and become the symbol of a new Japanese nationalism. This is the Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo, where many Japanese come to remember their fallen. Unlike their former allies, the Germans, there is little public guilt in Japan. Every soldier was told that after he'd sacrificed his life for his nation, his race, and above all for his emperor, his spirit would rest in this shrine as a god, and that the emperor himself would worship him. More than two and a half million names are enshrined here, most of them from Japan's long war, which began with the invasion of China in 1931 and ended with the surrender on the battleship Missouri in 1945. The scale of this carnage helps to explain the strong anti-militarist feeling among many Japanese, a feeling that ambitious, pro-militarist politicians disregard at their peril. <laughs> Former Imperial Navy commander Ryogoro Suzuki was a cherry blossom pilot, better known as a kamikaze. What makes the Yasukuni Shrine very different from an ordinary cenotaph is that among those honored here are more than a thousand war criminals, including 14 Class A criminals whose names were secretly enshrined in 1978. Seven of these were hanged by the Allies, including the Japanese wartime leader, General Tojo, and they were among the heroic souls deified by Prime Minister Nakasone when he became the first Japanese leader since the war to worship here in his official capacity. It caused a great deal of controversy. There were public demonstrations in China where Japanese atrocities, such as the rape of Nanking, are not forgotten. In Japan itself, what sometimes seems like public indifference became an agonizing. For example, the brother of a corporal who died fighting for the emperor may have echoed the feelings of many Japanese when he complained about political manipulation of the memories of Japan's own victims of the war, its ordinary people. My brother's soul, he wrote, will never rest peacefully with General Tojo nearby. However, for many people, the Prime Minister's performance here with its air of defiance was a deeply symbolic act that would speed the process of re-examining the past, if not rewriting it, even whitewashing it. For the most conservative in the establishment that has ruled Japan for 40 years, it meant that the time for penance, for eating humble pie, was over, that Japan should no longer be a rich eunuch among the developed nations of the world, but there's a new Japan, powerful not only in its trading surpluses, but in its growing strategic role and its military might. Article 9 of the post-war constitution states, the people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation. Land, sea and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The constitution allows Japan to spend 1% of its gross national product on a self-defense force. 
Behind this mask is the second largest military power in Asia, after China, and the seventh largest in the world. In the same way that Japanese industry rolls out the goods of peace, it is tool to roll out the goods of war. This military growth has been insidious, and many Japanese are unaware of it. They meant that uh, the ratio of military expenditure to the total GNP should remain the same. But as the GNP has grown up you know, tremendously, the total uh, you know, uh, amount or the absolute amount of the military expenditure has been growing up quite remarkably. And, but the you know, ratio remained the same, and that deluded a lot of Japanese. As the commercial and strategic center of the world transfers from Europe and the Atlantic to Asia and the Pacific, Japan's dominant position is clear. Next to China and the Soviet Union and overlooking all of Southeast Asia, Japan controls the straits through which the Soviet Pacific fleet must pass from its home base in Vladivostok. Far from renouncing war, Japan today is host to 119 American military facilities and is America's unsinkable aircraft carrier in the east. Despite this, the Reagan administration wants Japan to completely rearm and to be a full regional power. Japan is vulnerable to pressure from Washington and Prime Minister Nakasone has agreed to take part in the development of Star Wars technology. But does this spell danger for Japan's unique peace constitution and for the recent lesson of its history? And is this lesson of history understood by those born since 1945? In history, we don't teach uh, about World War II in Japan. It's like taboo. You don't talk about it. But you something about, about it. World War II is taught, isn't it? Well, when it happened and we lost, that's all about <laughs> No, No detail? No, no. Did you, did you learn at school, for instance, about mm -hmm. what the Japanese did in China, such as in Nanking? No, King? no, 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 never, never in school. I studied myself. Why, why didn't... Why weren't you taught this, do you think? Because it's embarrassment for them. For I who? I for older generation. Who, and I think they feel very guilty, but they don't want to... They don't want to teach, or they, don't, they want to forget about it. The biggest taboo is the Nanking Massacre in China in 1937 when an estimated 100,000 civilians were slaughtered by Japanese troops. In Japanese textbooks today, Nanking is a mere footnote. In Japan, the government has been supported by the government of the government and the government of the government. In the case of the Nanking of the Nanking, the Nanking of the Nanking is not the case of the Nanking of the Nanking, but the Nanking of the Nanking of the Nanking え、あの話の中にはかなり幻の部分があるというような形であの水を割る薄めるこの主張が出てきているそういうことこの絡み合いの中で検定が得られなされているわけです。In 1986, Professor Ian Arga lost a 20-year legal battle to prevent government censorship of textbooks. It's an issue directly related to the rise of the new nationalism, especially under Prime Minister Nakasone, whose wider strategy is to convince the Japanese people that they should forget the negative past. いう風に考えられていますので、教科書の内容を変えることで国民の一般のものの考え方を全部コントロールできるようになっている。そこが一番大問題だと思うわけです。In Japan some people think it is better not to teach certain things than to teach everything. And um some of the uh, atrocities, some of the uh, invasions that Japanese imperial armies committed during the war are not fully conveyed to the younger generation. And um, 
they say that is out of constellation not to give too much of a clue or facts to the younger children. But I think it is a wrong attitude. I think it is much better to let students learn everything and then decide what is best for themselves and for the country. This is a kindergarten in Tokyo run by a liberally minded woman who allows the children a measure of free expression. It's of a type becoming increasingly rare in Japan. By the time these children are 10, many of them will be enrolled at a cramming school known as Juku. These have become huge financial enterprises in Japan. We have a very strict entrance examination system. And even kindergarten kids have to prepare themselves to be admitted at one of the best uh, grade schools. So uh, if you are lucky and you, you start with this uh, sort of first class grade school and then you might have a chance to be admitted at the uh, first class uh, junior high school. That's a pen. The result is extraordinary pressure on young people in Japan. This is a cramming school preparing students for an English exam. It's seven o'clock at night and many of these youngsters have been on the go, reading, memorizing since early morning. Some are exhausted, but they go on, hoping to get not just a place in a university, but in the best university. Not just a good job, but one of the dwindling jobs for life. These are hands. These are hands. In school, children are encouraged all the time to do better and better. At home, they are encouraged by the parents to go to the better school. Therefore, they have to study harder and harder. And the pressure is really great. And um, though we are very smooth on the surface, in order to survive and have a good life in this society, you really have to be very competitive. More than 35% of Japanese children go to university compared with less than 5% in Britain. And they get there via these cramming schools. This is the welcoming ceremony at one of Japan's biggest and richest crammers held in Tokyo's main sumo wrestling stadium. Actually, I think for every Japanese, this competitive system follows you uh, uh, from uh, cradle to uh, grave. Although Japan's rate of suicide among young people is far from the highest in the world, it comes in waves and is often related to the pressure of exams or to rebellion or bullying. This bullying, a Japanese phenomenon, took the life of 13-year-old Hirofumu Shigawa, who had to suffer a mock funeral staged by both children and teachers. Going against tradition, his grieving parents have brought public attention to school bullying. And yet the young people you see in the street appear confident, affluent, and gracious. There are no groups of young men looking menacing, no yobbos. And although they'll be dressed in Western clothes, their highly conformist displays of non-conformity will be distinctly Japanese. <laughs> Most of 
the young people are not very much interested in the emperor. And, but uh, they don't see any point of criticizing him because they think that uh, the post for Japan gave these young people a good life. So as long as nation or the state or the emperor or the prime minister gives us good life, they will support it. But if we are asked to, for instance, if Mr. Nakasone tomorrow says that now we want to have big, big, big military forces, so young people have to be uh, what you conscripted, oh, there would be a tremendous upheaval. Because they, those people, young people are depoliticized, they don't have strong loyalty to the state. The most enduring mask is on the women of Japan. Since 1945, they've had some of the most favorable legislation for women in the world. And yet they've gained little by comparison with other developed nations. In Japan still, we women are expected to look prettier, soft, speak soft, mm. and behave well. Mm. Though we don't do that nowadays. <laughs> I, th I, I think there's a high degree of success. I, well, I, as I said, mm. our women are not expected to express our opinion very blunt way. This is another, another element. We are expected to say things in, in a feminine way so that it will not hurt the ego of the possibly male counterpart. This is a traditional wedding. He's a salesman, she's a bank teller. They're middle class. In many such couples, the woman will handle the family finances, perhaps receiving her husband's pay direct from his employer. If the man works for a large company, the wife probably won't see much of him, as most evenings and weekends he'll be expected to entertain customers or his boss. If the wife has a job, she'll probably have signed a pledge promising to leave when she gets married, or she'll be sacked when her first baby is due. Whatever her job, she will have been paid less in relation to her male counterpart than in any other developed country. In April 1986, an equal opportunities law was passed. When I asked a Labour Ministry official why women were paid less than men, even less social security than men, I was told, well, you see, custom in Japan is stronger than law. <laughs> あの、レベルから落ちたくない。あの、この落ちてはですね、もうこの行けないという必死の思いでみんな頑張ってるわけですね。だから、あの、落ちこぼれにもなるなっていうのが、あの、親の子供に対する願いであるし、あの、親の方
that is that is really the heart of the matter. They take things, they accept things that to most of us would be, would be intolerable. And acceptance of very, very cruel, a very, very cruel regimen at the working place, be it a factory or be it an office, that's certainly, certainly very high on the list of things that they accept, and the point is exactly that. Are young people accepting it? Will they go on accepting it? Might there not be among their fathers a feeling that perhaps it hasn't been worth it? Japanese banks and insurance companies are absolutely gigantic and, and so rich, but the people aren't. We do not feel very poor, we are poor. When you look at social capital, accumulation of it, very, very small as compared with your society. When we look at um, welfare system, welfare policies, very little is done. Working mother always have difficulty in finding a kindergarten to put their daughter in it. And when we have um, you know, sick person at home, what do we do? Or old people? What do we do? There are not many public services available for that sort of people. Therefore, we have to protect ourselves. In that sense, we are very poor. As the yen continues to rise, pricing Japanese goods out of markets they once conquered, Japanese workers may find that it's their jobs that are being exported now. Look carefully at your Japanese camera. It may be made in Taiwan. This is a great irony for the Japanese people as their industry moves abroad in search of higher profits and cheaper imitators of themselves. Today, the facade of Japan is strong and confident, but the cracks reveal that many working people are quite unlike the happy stereotypes and living conditions are poor in relation to the nation's wealth and the young are trapped in a molding process which too often leads to tragedy. Today's Japan is vulnerable because it imports much of its food and most of its energy and is tied to the fortunes of the United States. If the American economy further weakens, causing anti-Japanese sentiment to grow in threatened American industries, restrictions on Japanese imports are likely and the effects in Japan will be unpredictable. What are now ripples on a tranquil surface could become raging waves. Of course, Japan is luckier than Britain whose history of imperial success gives modern British leaders an inflated sense of Britain's power and significance. Many Japanese are not burdened by such nostalgia. They know that their imperial adventures brought them only pain and suffering. And it's this awareness that is the key to Japan's survival. But despite all the pressures that they live under, it seems to me that their everyday kindness, modesty and grace remain unaffected. Of all their achievements in recent years, this may be their greatest. Japan is a long way from being a country in crisis, certainly in the economic sphere. But success does seem inevitably to bring problems, or at least anomalies, some of them wonderfully ironic. For instance, because of a rising standard of living and increasing production costs in Japan, together with the increasing value of the yen, some Japanese industries are moving their manufacturing out of Japan to countries where production costs are lower. So we find Honda and Mazda now building cars in the United States, some of them for export to Japan, where, one supposes, they may be subject to tariffs to protect the Japanese car industry. Don't worry, it makes a crazy kind of sense. Next week, Cross Currents explores not a country, but an event which created a country, indeed two countries. 50 years ago, most of the nations we know today didn't exist. One of them is Pakistan, the nation that was never intended, but proved to be inevitable. A byproduct of India's independence the birth of Pakistan triggered perhaps the greatest spontaneous migration in human history and the deaths of a quarter of a million people. We hear what it was like in that summer of 1947 to live through that cataclysm from some of the people who did live through it. Division of hearts.
next week on Cross Currents. Here's a preview. Where communities are so mixed, it is, of course, impossible to draw boundaries which will segregate Hindus on the one hand, Muslims on the other. The result is that there are two virtual migrations in progress. For Muslim refugees, in their tens of thousands, are fleeing from India into Pakistan. It was a foregone conclusion that something like this would happen when British authority withdrew. And Britain's sympathy undoubtedly goes out to all the peoples of the two new dominions at this time of trial. जिसले उन्हें नू ले आगे छे छे कार सी बच्चे समेत ट्रक पार ले उन्हें नू कहने लगे कि समार रहे हैं दो इतने तो आधा फिर पचा देंगे ते तुसी जो तो आधे कोल पैसा सोना जो भी चीज़ है ना वो तुसी साथ ले नू ले ले थोड़ी जी दूर जा के जिस राज खजूर लग गए उन्हें देखा तो जा के ट्रक दे वे चंज कर के पटरावल पाह के तो उन्हें वाक जला देते छे दे छे कार विचे खत्म कर देते लेकिन वो माहिया सी तो सूल बक्श ना सी तो मुसलमान उसने बात पिंडा जिस ना कर ले था ना ऐसा बंदा जान को नहीं देना था मार देने सारे थे उन्ह पहला तो मुसलमान पर माश नहीं मारे आपने कहा उस बात पे ना आपने अठारह जी कदर की थी उसे ये मैंने तो उसी ये पूछो कि मैं उसे जाना चाहूँ ना फिर आपने कहा जो कि मैं कहा कि मेरा उन कार्यां के थे उस कार्यों ऑनली जिन्ना खून खराबा करवाया सी कि वापस जान ली और तुम वध नहीं होए। For Cross Currents, I'm Jim Carney. Good night.